This is SLED EUC webinar series, session number one. What is Workspace ONE Access? So quick uh, agenda here so you can see. We're going to go over introductions, kind of talk about the next sessions, what's coming, um, and then kind of delve into what we're doing today with why Workspace ONE Access? Where did it come from? What does it actually do? And then talk about some of uh, the use cases we see across uh, the verticals of state and local healthcare and and higher ed. So with that, um, my name is David Seaman. I am a solutions engineer here at, e at VMware and happy to be here this morning. Art? Yep, uh, solutions engineer as well as everybody could see. And uh, uh, I'm based out of Denver, we're actually uh, all over the country. Uh, David, I'll give it for you that you're out in uh, New York. Yep. Um, but across the country, uh, covering state and local government and uh, no joking aside, I, I love to dress up as a robot and dance around to Herbie Hancock for all the Herbie Hancock lovers out there. So thanks for having us this morning. Hey there, I'm Wayne Bridges. I'm, uh, I'm on the left in this picture you see here. Uh, what would a Zoom be without uh, showing off grandkids, right? So uh, that's my grandson, number one in the picture with me. I'm based in Springfield, Missouri. And I'm back to uh, Dave. That's right. But wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, so today we're covering what is Workspace ONE Access. Next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we're going to be diving into ZTNA. So if you don't know what those four little letters mean, uh, come back next week and we're going to be diving into ZTNA. And then the third week, so in two weeks from today, we're going to be talking about what is VMware and ZTNA look like. Again, same bat time, same bat channel, just over the next three weeks. So stay tuned, lots of good stuff coming. And with that, why Workspace One Access? I'll go ahead and take it away. And so yeah, the, this is the front end uh, for us. And let's see, working on trying to control. Um, it, I've been a, uh, an employee of VMware for 11 plus years. Over the last nine years, I've actually seen an evolution in the experience I get to afford as a VMware employee. And working as everybody here on this call, David, Wayne, myself, we are end user computing solutions engineers. And in the market of end user computing, anything that touches an end user, the two things that we see on this slide of consumer simple, and enterprise secure should always be the outcome that we're attempting to achieve. Now, granted, technologies of the past haven't always met a good balance between this. It's either easier for the user, but maybe we're sacrificing security or we're putting more security in place and the user's experience is now being hindered. So with access and everything that we're gonna be talking about today, we're, allowed, we're enabling IT to up-level the, the service on both sides of the equation, consumer simple and enterprise secure. Now the market on what this ultimately needs to touch. Oh, click there. There we go, took a second. Uh, is that we are in this space today. We need to be able to deliver from any cloud on premise in your own private data centers to any you know, software as a service offering out there, or maybe even infrastructure as a service. So as a service offerings in any cloud, that is the landscape where ultimately, you know, our applications live. But then once we have those applications hosted, the any app to any device is very relevant. So the uh, ability as a user in the landscape that we live today to easily consume based on my requirements as a user to uh, you know, carry my applications with me. If I'm in the office, maybe I'm on a laptop or even a desktop, but if I'm out and about in the field, a mobile device just makes more sense. So having that ability to choose the device that it meets my business needs is absolutely necessary. So this, this is very real. Now, from a consumer simple perspective, any device, any application, any device really meets that balance that we're talking about. But of course, the enterprise security, it must be upheld all the time. 
And this is where intrinsic security comes into play. Throughout the entire stack, we are always covering our bases, ensuring that the consumption of the application and the data is ultimately secure. So to continue down this theme, by the way, we're gonna continue down this of consumer simplicity, enterprise security, and how does that apply to everything that we're talking about here? So for me, like I said, 11 years working at VMware, the last nine have actually been a remote user. So I have a pretty well-established office right now uh, in my basement, uh, a mix of work and pleasure where I get to, I, I like to dabble in music and also get to be able to have the privilege of speaking to folks like yourself in meetings like this. And then on top of that, as you can see here, I am continuing to slack off, but also maybe work, mixing work with pleasure as I'm having a Zoom meeting with Mr. David Seaman there on the screen, as you can see. Now, this is all in the basement and I've established this and I'm working hard at home and for many respects, working from home has its caveats. Getting away from the work can be challenging because it's always there, right at my fingertips, which is great. I have it, I stay productive. But sometimes I'd like to avoid not being this guy in the basement where I might be losing my sanity a little bit. So I gotta get out every once in a while. So get out of the basement, get out on the back porch. Now, once again, maintaining productivity makes a big deal, is a big deal to me. So having my laptop and then another device easily accessing, accessing the application, I can dynamically move my workspace now to the back porch, getting my son, eating my lunch, and uh, having both my iPad and my laptop giving me that dual screen experience. Um, but then port being even more portable, talk about mixing work with pleasure. If I need to get out and, and maybe go snowboarding or go mountain biking, I actually do this and this is very real. So I have my cell phone in my pocket, it's very portable. And admittedly, if weather was permitting, I could be running this meeting right now from these types of venues. Now, once again, maybe a little bit of productivity could be sacrificed, but for the most part, when I'm being called upon, I can pull over and get my job done right from, the, from my cell phone. And, and with a very intuitive experience, I'm not sitting there shuffling around, trying to navigate security to getting my, hack, my hands on the applications that I ultimately need to do my job. Now, my priorities have changed, admittedly. I, I'm kind of growing up a bit, and uh, you know, I, I've got a family. We were growing up over here. So th now this is me carrying my work into the kitchen or carrying my work to the dinner table while I'm feeding my kid. Or maybe I was actually doing this about five minutes ago. I got to get some laundry done. And uh, my laptop is sitting there with, with me, getting, keep maintaining that productivity. Now, one thing that was interesting about uh, the pandemic is that it was called upon me to build my girls a playhouse. The, uh, the parks were closed and the kids can't go and play at the parks. And I'm like, dang it, I gotta do something about this. So I'm in the garage this last summer during pandemic, I was building a playhouse in the backyard, but as you can see, got my trusty little laptop over here. And interestingly enough, I still maintain quite a level of productivity. And I'm saying that by the way, while my boss is on the line. So he's hearing all about this right now. <laughs> now, the great part about this and the whole point of this story is that my life dictates quite a bit on how I work and I need applications easily accessible and, and accessible in a very intuitive way. And this is where we start to talk about the security aspect of this is that I just said, I have a consumer simple experience taking my applications, moving around all over my office and all over the great state of Colorado, having fun, taking care of my kids. That's consumer simple. From an enterprise security perspective, we ultimately are doing more than just single sign-on into applications, ease of access into applications. I'm not hunting down for username and password for every application. I have an easier way of consuming it, but that easier way of consumption actually affords us a better security posture, ultimately up-leveling, enterprise security. So I'll, it, actually, I don't have the pen on me at the moment, but to draw your eyes on, to your attention of what you're seeing on the screen, bottom left-hand corner, we're looking at our identity. Is it Active Directory? Are we using Okta? What, who, who is the source of authentication to say, 
I am Arthur Ashman signing into this environment. To the right of that, on the bottom, you see that we have device posture. So we can now take device posture and say, do I get access to the application? Is my device secure enough to going in, uh, having access to everything that I intend on interacting with as a user? And then on the top, security policy. This is endpoint security. This is policy, anything you want. We add, we add this into an aggregate in the middle of an access control plane that ultimately uses all of these checks and balances, all these vectors potentially of for attack and protecting each one of them to ultimately saying, do I get access to, you know, the cloud access security broker with the applications or enterprise systems or enterprise networks. So you get the point is, is that we are up leveling enterprise security by doing more than just username and password. Who are you as you as you who are you as a user? But we are actually aggregating all of these pieces to getting the access to the application. So now uh, to kind of talk a little bit about the evolution of how we got here as VMware, uh, let Wayne uh, take it over. Thanks for that, Art. Um, so we we have grown. Uh, this product has grown uh, from a uh, an initial acquisition by VMware into the uh, the product we all know and love uh, as Workspace One Access. Um, so many of you came to know uh, the product as VMware Identity Manager, um, which we introduced uh, from this blog article uh, back in 2015. Uh, VMware Identity Manager uh, was based on Horizon Workspace, um, which was in turn based on Horizon Application Manager, uh, which grew from the acquisition we originally made of TriCypher uh, back in 2010. Now, TriCypher was a company a tool that was built for managing uh, SaaS-based uh, apps in the cloud. Um, so our evolution in this space uh, becomes apparent uh, through this series uh, of, of product changes uh, and evolution here. Um, as we continue, this was, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it was called VMware Identity Manager until mid-2019. Uh, and there was a uh, Brian Madden article that came out about then uh, talking about that change. And he said that, you know, essentially the, the product does much more than identity management. And in fact, identity management, identity lifecycle management is the one thing that it doesn't really do well. Um, so to put it in context, uh, identity-based access uh, to all of our resources is what the product provides. Um, so it combines uh, existing identity providers and authorization methods uh, and networks uh, to create these contextual access policies uh, for all of our resources. Uh, so to sum all of this up, we originally positioned this tool as an identity manager. And our customers decided that it you know, doesn't really do that uh, particularly well. So they started to daisy chain all of their IDPs and their auth methods uh, to create auth authentication flows into resources. Uh, so with the help of our customers, we discovered this was an identity broker and that the value that we provide through Workspace ONE Access is that of single sign-on and conditional access. So I'm uh, going to turn it back over to Art so that he can show us what this looks like uh, in practice. Thanks. So let's see what this user experience looks like, and we're going to kind of identify a little bit of this environment, what, how security ultimately applies to this uh, solution. Let me go ahead and click in there. So let's see, here we go. We'll let this run through. And this is live, I, well, live it being on my MacBook. I'm a MacBook user myself. And this is how we work day in and day out at VMware. And as you can see, I'm selecting a certificate in the end that gives me access to the applications. So once I have that certificate in my hands, I now have single sign-on access into Microsoft applications, 
We also have single sign-on into non-Microsoft applications like SAP Concur. And also virtualized applications. And this even applies to native applications. So single sign-on experience. Now I got my hands on that certificate is under device management. So my, my, the checks and balances have been made to say, yep, my device is secure. And because my device is secure, I get that certificate to get access to the environment. Now, let's say in this demonstration that that certificate ultimately is compromised because my device has been compromised. So what this will show is that we're going to bypass the certificate and say it, it is no longer valid. And as you can see, I am now prompted for step up authentication, which in this case would be RSA. So ultimately getting access to the same exact environment. So when I put my passcode in, I'll be able to ultimately get access to the resources. And this is just a tip of the iceberg um, in regard to what we're capable of. But this is just a big piece. And I really love the fact that certificate based off, once again, gives me a better experience from a user perspective. I'm not hunting down my username and password because I already logged in with, onto my device with the username and password. So, oh, get out of there and click there. Okay, so I kind of explained the story of what just happened. Let's take a look about look at that in the background. So Workspace One Access, once again, is an aggregate of all different types of vectors to ultimately saying, I am authenticated to getting access to the application. And we use all these different protocols on the right, SAML, WSFED, Kerberos, to getting access to the application. But in the end, on the left, it's all those different vectors. So I have, as you saw, there was a certificate. And RSA was my fallback authentication method. And in access, we define this through an access policy. So here we could see on the top, coming in from a specific network range, in this regard, it's all network ranges. So Starbucks network or on the local LAN, doesn't matter. Well, all ranges are, are covered. Web browser, as you saw, I'm going through Google Chrome to consuming this environment. And then towards the bottom, you can see authenticate using certificate. And then once again, the fallback method is RSA. Now we can control this quite a bit and say, nope, certificate has been uh, revoked uh, for any particular reason from a security threat. So maybe we don't want a fallback method. So this is some of the thought process that you can go through in regard to securing your application. And another thing to mention is choosing what is the appropriate level of security for the application. And we can say that this policy applies to uh, your medium security applications. And we could say a different policy would apply to your high security applications. And then maybe we'll have another one that says, no, these applications just go willy nilly and, and we'll be lax on our security policy. But know that in the end, you saw the user experience, once again, consumer simple experience. And I never did I have to hunt down for my concur SAP username and password to get authenticated into anything. It's all at my fingertips. So, what else was in there? In that experience that we just had, I, it's a consumer simple experience. We did a lot to make this a, a very delightful. I heard the term delightful experience that we're affording to users within this uh, application. Ultimately, Workspace ONE Access, also known as Workspace ONE Intelligent Hub. In this environment, a single sign-on experience where I can get access to web and virtual and native applications one thing I might highlight here, it might be a little bit hard to read. As you see, it says categories, all apps, web apps, and then Mac apps. That's where I actually get to even self-service install applications natively on my MacBook. So really managing the applications in a self-service way, um, it, it just screams volumes when it comes to being able to support a remote workforce. Also a thing to consider is in there, there's a component called people search where I can navigate uh, who's who in my organization and get access to their contact information so that I know 
how to get in contact with them. And actually, when you consume this, even on a mobile phone, just clicking on uh, the phone number and automatically calling uh, the individual that you're trying to get access to in a single uh, global access, uh, global address list, um, it, it just puts everybody's contact information really at my fingertips. Another thing to be aware of is the notifications area where you can notify your customers of new applications that you want to expose to the remote workforce and maybe even notify them of pertinent information uh, going on in your organization. Uh, maybe you have an office closure or uh, elevators under maintenance and people need to be notified of this. One thing to send out an email blast, but here's another place where they can consume information uh, once again, pertinent to the organization. And then last thing I'll indicate is this employee self-service uh, section where we can put in helpful links. These are web links to anything that they need from a support perspective. They can manage their devices that are ultimately consuming this environment. And there's a section here, contact information at the bottom where they know how to get a hold of IT and support and things of that nature. Now, the great thing about the web links section of it is this is a direct line to just say, hey, you need a login ticket. One I see in the market quite a bit is ShareWell. So put a link into ShareWell and go ahead and open up your, uh, your support ticket right from one place uh, within the overall experience. And then the last piece I'll say is go crazy with your branding. Make this unique for yourself, right? As you, you're creating an experience for your users, you, take, you can take some pride in it. I mean, of course, you can use VMware's default settings, which isn't bad. But at the same time, I know that everybody has their own branding to work with. So why not go ahead and put some flavor in there and, uh, and ensure that you get the personality of your company within this overall user's experience. So from that, let's put it all together and I'll let David uh, take it away from here. Hi, thanks, Art. And actually, I'm going to pause for one second just to remind people, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to go put them in the Q&A panel. I'm happy to answer your questions as we're going along here. But really wanted to just kind of, uh, again, kind of rehash everything that we've been talking about. You already saw this slide earlier and Art kind of went over it, right? Like we have a very simple user portal. It's that point, click, give me my application mentality right? Very consumer centric. Um, but we're able to tie all of these pieces to gain access to the resources that a user needs. So to kind of say it a different way, or to maybe look at it in a different perspective, right, is that we're able to take that portal, all those applications, and start looking at things like device compliance, right? Is the, uh, is the OS up to date? Or is uh, are we dealing with someone's like really old, uh, you know, Windows 7 or Windows XP machine, right? Do, do we really want potentially a compromised OS accessing our, our applications in our data center? Is the device managed? Has it been jailbroken if we're talking like mobile devices, right? Um, what kind of third-party apps are on that device? Um, where is it located? Is it really on that Starbucks Wi-Fi network or uh, is it not? And, and again, all of these start to come into play and whether or not we decide to grant access to applications. And then we start tie in what traditional security uh, is all about, which is like, you know, hey, what's your username and password? Well, what about uh, uh, who we authenticate with, right? Like, let's go beyond the legacy Active Directory, start being able to layer in things like Ping, Okta, Shibboleth, Azure AD. Um, and uh, again, do we have differing sources of authentication per application? Um, this can be huge because sometimes we have applications that are tied in with Azure AD, and then maybe we have legacy applications that are using a uh, native Active Directory and they can't consume some of the more modern uh, auth identity uh, style stores. Um, and again, we've already kind of talked about network scope, but, but even things like authentication strength, like, does that, does that device have a passcode on it? Do we accept biometrics, right? For some ease of access type things, right? And then lastly, we can actually put a risk score to all of this. So using some machine learning and AI, we can kind of combine all of these things and, and put it together and say, hey, you know, uh, if, if it's jailbroken and they've got all kinds of risky applications on there that we don't know about, maybe some blacklisted apps, 
maybe we're going to, you know, say that this user is kind of a risky user and therefore they can only access some of the basic applications or for some of those mission critical, instead of maybe it being a native application on the endpoint, maybe we're going to run that in our data center as a virtual application. So a virtual desktop or a published app, um, because again, we just want to eliminate uh, the possibility of malware and things like that. So again, at the end of the day, it's about taking all of this and granting access to our applications based on all of our policies and uh, identity sources. Uh, so to say it another way, it's all about the apps, right? Um, and uh, being able to have that, uh, uh, no matter what device you have or what device the user has, they have that same experience across all of their device types and form factors. Um, and lastly, just to, to show exactly what this means uh, in yet another way, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Um, again, we're talking native mobile apps, uh, be it in-house ones that you've developed yourself that you push out to them or ones from the public stores. So from, from the Apple store, or the Android, you know, the Google Play store, uh, Windows store, et cetera. Um, it's also web apps. So Office 365, Salesforce, or, or if you're a slacker like Art, that, that concur that has no travel for the past year. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to integrate with third-party IDPs, you can see some of them here. Shibboleth, Ping, ADFS, Okta, OneLogon. Uh, so again, lots of choices. Um, and then again, those on-premise applications. And we can do it multiple different ways. We can do per application tunnel, um, where just that executable, so if we're talking Windows, just that executable only has access to that, that backend application in your data center. Again, all properly secured. Um, being able to offer up virtual applications, uh, be them virtual desktops or, or published applications. And, and again, even Windows applications or OS X applications natively. So again, lots of possibilities here. And at the end of the day, right? Now, now that we've kind of really quickly gone through how Workspace ONE access, wh where it sits, kind of what it does is, well, what does this mean for you? And you know, how, how can we actually apply this? So we wanted to take a moment and kind of start talking about what we commonly see across the different verticals in SLED. And so Wayne, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and uh, to bring up our next segment. Sounds great, David, thank you. Um, <clears throat> As we said in our introductions, uh, we support many state and local agencies. Uh, this rarely means that we have a set and forget set of use cases to address. Uh, more often than that, uh, it means that you know, we work with a parent, city, county, state government, uh, and that serves many departments or many sub agencies. Uh, this might mean a state government with its departments of transportation, taxation, health and human services, and uh, along with that, an expansive court system, emergency management systems. Uh, so departments are, are subject to different types of compliance, uh, be that healthcare, criminal justice, privacy. Um, and it could be a, uh, you know, at the same time, a county government or a city government, uh, still managing those various departments um, and still subject to many of the, the same compliance rules. Uh, perhaps even then, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with an agency in that city or county uh, um, entity that, that might have a smaller staff than their, their state government counterparts. Um, so from this perspective, um, what, what we do is enable uh, what we call a multimodal style of work. So uh, over the last year, many of our, our users have gone uh, remote uh, and uh, the benefits of incorporating Workspace ONE access uh, in that strategy uh, becomes you know, a very simple uh, touch-free experience uh, for our end users. 
um, they get a very personalized uh, set of uh, resources. Um, so that touch-free IT allows us to deliver um, devices uh, directly to users um, with modern management, uh, out-of-the-box workflows uh, that save time and getting access to that resource catalog, um, that user experience that we've been showing you. Uh, furthermore, um, we can uh, um, uh, onboard these employees uh, completely remotely um, and even offboard them uh, when necessary. Uh, freedom of choice uh, factors in in every organization now. And this means that I'm used to using a certain type of device. I use an iOS phone, Art uses a, uh, a Samsung Galaxy. Um, so we, we have some, some differences there. Um, and that freedom of choice and the ability to enable a user on the device of their choice or the device that's simply available at the time uh, provides a great deal of power for us. And then the ability to uh, ensure the security uh, of access to these applications uh, gives us the right type of, of uptime and access uh, to those resources. I double clicked. Finally, a, uh, you know, the benefits of incorporating Workspace ONE access into your environment provide several benefits. Uh, first and foremost, a simple, user experience for the end user. We've shown that over and over here. Uh, security that's integrated at every level, um, whether that's device security in and of itself or the ability to uh, provide for multi-factor authentication or the right type of authentication for the right users on the right devices. Um, and a management inter interface that's, that's uh, consistent across all, di all types of devices uh, and uh, consistent for the end users so that they're able to access uh, from a common application catalog, no matter what platform they are using. Uh, and finally, a, uh, a single uh, unified platform for all of our users and our administrators uh, to, to be able to provide these re resources. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Art for the uh, healthcare um, side of this. Thanks, Wayne. And so to move into healthcare, um, I'd like to really just address the top challenges that we're seeing. And I think actually even to Wayne's slides, every market gets to benefit in some form or fashion the, the use cases that, uh, that Wayne was talking about and even vice versa of what I'm about to talk about in healthcare. Now, especially over the last year, uh, my literal, if you see me in the, vi the video, my hat's off to any healthcare workers out there. They're having to deal with a lot and it's a stressful environment that they ultimately have to maintain a, a level of compliance uh, as well as maintain a level of uh, positive patient care and you know, trying to provide a quality care for patients. Um, and, and because of that, these challenges really are very relevant. Um, that suboptimal experience, I just couldn't even imagine. If I am a healthcare worker trying to help patients and I'm actually patient facing, and I'm just trying to do the bet, my best job, adhering to HIPAA compliance, but also just ensuring that I'm concentrating on the patient instead of having to concentrate on IT challenges, a suboptimal experience will just not do. And then at the same time, when we're talking about this HIPAA compliance, Fragmented security is it, just, it was a natural progression that has occurred. Organizations in a traditional model of security has created a piecemeal way of purchasing where they, maybe they bought one firewall solution and they bought another intrusion detection system and they, they bought other pieces that ultimately created their security posture to adhere to compliance. And maybe they're meeting their requirements but now we've created this operational complexity in our environment that we lack holistic view of the overall organization and maybe even have inconsistent policy around across the organization, ultimately giving security folks um, uh, you know, uh, uh, some pain points when it comes to trying to remediate security issues. And then not to mention, of course, going back to patient care, 
for anybody in patient care, having to navigate that fragmented security just can be very problematic and disruptive to their job. So in the end, this is impact to employee engagement and product productivity, both on the IT side, which is once again, the enterprise security side, as well as the consumer simple side, which is the patient care folks. So what we're here to do is really unify that overall experience starts to get into vendor consolidation, tool consolidation, and really meet the needs of all the stakeholders that we see on this screen. So in my opinion, we have the C-suite. We got the CIO and the CISO. CIO wants visibility and manageability of the overall environment. CISO ultimately wants to ensure we're keeping that HIPAA compliance secure, security and compliance. So this is the enterprise security part of the equation. On the right-hand side, We've got line of business and ultimately the employees. So my healthcare workers, my physicians and, and nurses and doctors are the employees and they just want a great experience and ultimately feel safe within that experience, knowing that, yes, I can interact with said application and, and but also ensuring that I'm keeping up to date on the security requirements of my role. And then once I have applications easily at my fingertips, just like I showed in that demonstration, ease of access to just clicking into applications, getting access to the data, all from any device, um, that ultimately drives collaboration. Now I can work with my fellow healthcare workers and deliberate and collaborate over any particular patient case that we happen to be talking about. So ease of access to the data ultimately drives collaboration and engagement. Now back over to the enterprise security back uh, part of the equation, because we've consolidated consumption into one place. Now we actually have visibility and the security and the compliance. And I love the visibility part of this is that it's one set of tools deeply integrated that we can automate or great pull up some great reports to really understand how users are interacting with the enterprise. And from there, by satisfying everybody's needs, we are improving morale, we are enabling, you know, line of business and the CISO to now be transformative in the experience that the user is actually going through and being transformative in, in how we define security as a healthcare organization. And other than that, as you can see here, you just benefit on so many fronts, highly engaged employees, reduced overhead because we've consolidated tools and you have a broader and more effective security because once again, it's, it's consolidated. It's one set of tools that give you visibility across the entire landscape with intrinsic integration, right? There's <laughs> so many words I can use to explain this, but it, that, that's the idea. Actually, you gain so much from consolidating your tools, but all while meeting your business needs. So from there, Let's go ahead and skip over to education, a favorite topic of ours, and I'll let David take it away. Awesome. And as you can tell, like, even though we're kind of breaking it down into these various uh, verticals, there's a lot of crossover. In fact, I would say each, each segment, you know, every, every segment benefits from the same things and same of education. But one of the things I actually wanted to focus on uh, in education is around what I call student experience. And, uh, you know, what is a student experience? And, you know, I, I, we feel that it's made up of physical experiences, technological experiences, and cultural experiences. And now more than ever, especially in, in the, the wake or, or in light of COVID, right? Physical experiences has been huge. Um, or the lack of, right? And, you know, because we went from a student being in class interacting with the professor to now they're they were doing a synchronous learning where you know they were in a class a zoom zoom uh, a zoom class with their uh, students or a, uh, a google meet and to to asynchronous learning right where you know it's kind of on demand because uh, you know maybe those those students are having to take care of their kids who are not able to go into school and so, again, the, the student experience has been drastically impacted, and this has sh shifted how we have to think about the student experience and their cultural experience and what technology they're going to use, right? And so, ultimately, 
you know, students are looking for um, a consistent experience, right? Doesn't matter what kind of device they have. They could be, they could be bringing in that $4,000 MacBook Pro or maybe that, that $200 uh, Google Chromebook that was issued by the school. Um, and again, this, this is, uh, I feel this is very applicable, not only to higher ed, but, you know, kind of K through 20, as it were, right? Um, it, it's, it's having that consistent experience that, you know, a student doesn't want to have to be like, oh, I left, that, I left my, uh, my uh, issued laptop back in my dorm room. And, uh, you know, I, I needed to be able to write that paper because it's due in 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, again, being able to have a consistent experience on any device. Um, and they want to be engaged. Uh, again, with, with COVID, it has definitely brought this to light of, you know, that students across the nation, across the world, right? How do we engage them remotely? How do we engage them so that they're, they're active participants in learning? And this has proved to be incredibly challenging, right? Um, and how do they have productive experiences? Um, and all of these things are kind of wrapped around, you know, the student experience. So, so how, does, how does Workspace ONE Access fit into all of this, right? And I wanted to tell a story about one of my customers, um, and they've actually been doing this for a little while, um, where they, uh, their students, maybe they start their day where they open up uh, Outlook in a web browser. Well, they get authenticated by Azure AD. Um, and, uh, you know, again, for the security conscious, maybe they're, they're two-factored, right? They have... Uh, some kind of two-factor, be it Azure, MFA, Duo, again, doesn't really matter. It says, yep, this is a student, and they're granted access to their, their Outlook and their email. Um, in their email, they see that their professor sent them a note that says, hey, I just assigned a new assignment. Um, uh, here's the link to the LMS. Go check it out. Here's your assignment. Click on that link. Takes them into their LMS. Um, now, again, they, uh, they had everything through Azure AD. And so it just takes them straight on in because they have that token. And you're thinking, well, you know, you haven't talked about Workspace ONE Access yet. You know, how does that fit into this picture? And in the LMS, what they did is they actually had a direct link to the application that the student needed to complete their lab, to complete their coursework. And so this, from the LMS, the student is able to click that link and it launched their application through Workspace ONE Access. And again, we had Workspace ONE access set up where Azure AD was the identity provider, and it just took them straight into their application. So in that, that user experience, just that scenario right there, the, the student signed in once, and they went to three different, completely different applications um, that were all tied together. And they had a consistent experience. They were engaged from start to finish. And they were able to be productive because they weren't having to hunt around and find, you know, what credentials did I have for, for, my, for my office? What credentials do I need for my, my, my LMS and my coursework? And what credentials did I need for that lab, right? And they're able to do this on the go from any device and have that experience. That's the power of what Workspace ONE Access brings is because it can tie all of this together. And you, can, you have the power to choose what that authentication flow looks like, what that, what that interaction with your enterprise applications look like. So again, being able to pick and choose, still have it be very secure. And from a student perspective, right? Consistent, engaging, and productive. So super powerful. Um, so <laughs> how do I get all this goodness, right? Um, you know, so you've been talking about Workspace ONE Access uh, this whole time. How, how do we get this? What's it all about? And so I have a lot of good news for you. Um, most of our customers, you may actually be surprised to know that you already own it. It might be part of a package that you uh, already have or are already licensed for. Um, so for those of you who have Horizon Enterprise, again, our, our virtual desktop and virtual application, uh, it's built into the Horizon Enterprise. Um, or Horizon Universal. Uh, it is built into those packages to have Workspace ONE access. And the same thing for Workspace ONE, which is our device management side. Uh, 
it is also built into there. Um, and really, Workspace ONE Access is the, the front door that combines all of these things together. Again, it's the portal that starts to combine this experience, whether it's virtual applications or we're talking native applications to the device. And again, always at the end of the day, if you have any questions about this or you know specific licensing things, feel free to reach out to your VMware rep. They would be happy to answer all your questions. I'm totally throwing them under the bus here. Reach out anyway. Um, and uh, we would definitely love to talk to you some more. So um, just taking a glance at the time, wanted to see, do we, have, do we have any questions come in? I don't think we have any questions, but if you do, uh, don't hesitate to, to put them in there. We're, we're kind of standing by waiting for questions if need be. But really, that was kind of the end of our content today. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Hopefully, you gained some, uh, some valuable insights into how Workspace ONE Access can help you and what it can do. Um, but wait, there's more. So tune in for next week where we, we kind of uh, build upon this, right? You know, you got kind of a hints of it today. Um, around ZTNA, and I'll give a spoiler here, that's Zero Trust Network Access. Um, and we're going to dive into what is that, what does it mean? And then the week after, you know, how does Workspace ONE Access, how does VMware take a look at ZTNA and incorporate that? And, and how, do we, how, how do we incorporate ZTNA? So definitely stay tuned for the coming weeks. Lots of exciting stuff. Um, and I still don't see any uh, last minute questions there. So just some other things to note. Don't forget to take a look at techzone.vmware.com. We have a lot of this content sitting out there, right there in TechZone. In fact, you can see on the slide here, there is a whole section just dedicated to Workspace ONE Access. And it's a whole uh, a course track where you can go through and you know kind of start from the very basics and, and kind of you know, master workspace one access. So lots of amazing content there in tech zone. Um, and another resource uh, again is our hands-on labs uh, where you can actually go and sign up for free and run the software and, and, and literally break the software in one of our labs. Um, it's a great way to, uh, uh, to, to utilize our software. By the way, there are a couple of questions that have come through. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the first one. We have Kenneth. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, how do you handle intergovernmental agencies and their access to our applications? If they have their own AD auth, can that organization also be included in access policies and such? And Kenneth, the answer is yes, yes, and absolutely yes. Um, the way that we do this, if you think about the, some of the slides that we had around aggregation, part of that aggregation exercise is being able to pull from multiple directory services. So if everybody has their own AD infrastructure, there's no trust or any transitive trust within your, uh, uh, within the forest, within your active directory infrastructure, um, that's not a problem. We can still aggregate, pull identity from multiple Active Directory environments and use that as an identity into applications and leveraging those access policies uh, to, to manage that authentication from those disparate directory services. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Actually, Wayne, David, anything to add on that one? Nothing to add. I mean, again, absolutely yes. And it, and it does help again for that kind of multi-agency, right? Where, where they do have very tight controls and manage their own, their own identity. And that's the beauty of access, right? Is you can still have that, that unified portal and different sources of identity behind it. And I'll keep going through the questions here. This one was anonymous. Uh, it says, can you just use Workspace ONE for a, uh, an identity manager versus Azure? Uh, and yeah, there is an answer on that is, is yes. Um, one thing that was great about Wayne's slides around the evolution of the product is that, and this is always the question, we used to be called identity manager, but we didn't do anything to actually manage the identity itself. It's coming from Active Directory or it's coming from Azure, uh, it's coming from Okta, it's coming from RSA. Um, but once again, we're using that identity to ultimately give us, uh, in many respects, a user principal name to hand off to an application or an email to hand off to an application to authenticate in. 
So the answer is, can we do it without Azure? Yes. Can, do, do we benefit to use, utilize Azure in this respect? Absolutely. Uh, one thing I might say in this regard is um, I really like the fact that how like VMware's approach overall in the market, we've always shined as I think an abstraction co uh, company. We work with multiple vendors, multiple investments, ensuring that customers can reap an ROI on not only the, the financial investment people have made within maybe Microsoft and Azure, but also the technical investment that's been made as well. So if you guys have spent time federating your identity into Azure, we can use that. It's, an, it's really an open ecosystem. Um, I could go on and on and on about that, but it's uh, that you have a lot of flexibility here. So great question. Um, David, Wayne, uh, what else do you see out there? I can keep going down the line if you'd like. So let me maybe add one thing back to, you know, the flip side of that is, is, is again, absolutely. I mean, we have a lot of customers that utilize uh, Workspace ONE Access as an IDP. Um, we also have a lot of customers who utilize Workspace ONE Access as a service provider, as an SP, right? And you can configure it either way. Uh, here at VMware, we, we utilize, uh, again, we front end our, our Microsoft Office with Workspace ONE Access as the IDP and not the other way around. Uh, so again, lots of flexibility in how you choose to make it work. And it really comes down to what is, what is your security policies dictate and what is the user flow that you want, so. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll jump here with uh, Marie's, uh, Marie Burke, uh, your comment around how does Workspace ONE UEM secure corporate content? So today we talked quite a bit about access being the front door. David alluded to it as the front door. I also like to look at it as kind of the, I've uh, been watching a lot of Game of Thrones lately. So I think of castles and moats and what are we ultimately protecting is the data and the application inside the castle. Access is the drawbridge. How do we get, act, how do we get access to that drawbridge? How do we get the drawbridge to open so users can get access to, in your terms, corporate content. Um, this actually does dive into the next part of our series. So I please, I implore you to uh, join the next webinar next weekend. And the one following um, is we get into this concept of zero trust network access. And it, we, we implore customers to adopt a zero trust model, especially when we're trying to protect corporate content. So stay tuned for that. But for a little tidbit of this, um, on-premise data center, especially where corporate content typically lives, most organizations in, a, in the remote workforce have leveraged technologies like VPN to get say, hey, I log in a VPN, I get access to the corporate content and, and the job is done. And of course we can do things like secure VPN, maybe with multi-factor authentication or things of that nature. We are taking this quite a bit of a step further and David's slides actually alluded to this quite well, where we're taking, you know, how are the users behaving with the platform uh, and maybe what applications live on the endpoint device, uh, uh, various factors. So I think to answer your question more concisely as I've kind of gone off already, my apologies for doing so, uh, the it, it, corporate content once again, we want to make sure that we are protecting it at multiple vectors of potential attack. We're trying to cover as many as we can, and we'll get into this quite a bit next week and, and the week following. So um, yeah, that, that I'd say without stealing too much thunder for the rest of it, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, Maybe I'll toss one Wayne's way. And do you, wanna, do you wanna talk about kind of the difference between Workspace ONE and Okta, uh, Wayne? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Workspace ONE Access uh, really is an access uh, management tool. So it, it allows us to create contextual access policies uh, for the way we're going to access resources. Uh, whereas Okta is, can do some of that as well, uh, but acts as more of an identity lifecycle management tool. So uh, a tool for onboarding your users, maintaining them uh, through Okta's directory and uh, allowing for that access as well. Um, so we 
in line with with Okta um, can provide, can act as David said, as an identity provider or a, a service provider in that flow of authentication. Additionally, Workspace ONE UEM can add device knowledge as a factor of authentication. So we can say not only is the user in a certain group within the Okta directory, but also are they accessing this resource from a device that's enrolled and or compliant uh, in order to provide an extra factor of security there. David, Art, anything to add on that one? No, oh, it's a great partnership. Um, Okta actually does a great job of identity management. We let them do it, and uh, but they lean on us, like you said, uh, for all the other uh, posture that we could bring to authentication. So very good. Uh, one last question in there, and I know we're at the top of the hour, two minutes left. Uh, Finley, uh, it, you were saying, are there any work to streamline the process of the upload of applications to Workspace ONE and the packaging process or leveraging the use of PowerShell to manage applications? Um, I, Wayne, I have my take on this. I was going to bring up things like branch cache uh, and even factory provisioning and how we're managing applications in that respect. But hey, with your expertise, maybe we might want to lean on you on this one. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, so there are some efficiencies that we've started to build in things like uh, leveraging branch cache for peer to peer delivery uh, of applications, as well as uh, factory provisioning with the OEMs, right? So uh, a device can come to you or come to your, your users uh, pre imaged or including the heaviest applications that they may use in the organization. Uh, beyond this, we've got tools like airlift uh, to help uh, to rationalize application collections from uh, system center if you're using that. And uh, we've, we've recently created something called the enterprise app repository, which is a set of uh, prepackaged applications uh, within Workspace ONE UEM uh, that helps you to uh, automatically bring those applications in. There's about a hundred of them right now and that collection's growing. Um, and uh, once they're in, it's as simple as assigning those to end users. Art or David, uh, anything uh, additional to add to that one? Last thing I'll add, right, is, is that we do have a very robust API. And so I would highly encourage you to go check out. We have a whole, like, there's a whole website that VMware has uh, across our entire product portfolio with APIs, code.vmware.com. Definitely check it out for a lot of those automation ideas. There's even code snippets and samples in there. Um, so all kinds of ideas, great place to, to look at, like ways to, to automate uh, process procedure, especially as it relates to the entire portfolio of products that VMware makes. So with that, we are at time. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, again, I've got the slide up there. Tune in next week, same bat time, bat channel, and we're going to dive into ZTNA. So again, thank you all for coming and have a great rest of your day.